You remember that day out in Wyoming, boys, when we rode on top of that bus? He never held a public office. As a politician, he was a rank amateur. Yet in a few incredible months, he nearly won the presidency of the United States. His name is Wendell Wilkie, and this is his biography. Mike Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Wendell Wilkie. He made a spectacular debut on the American political scene. Almost overnight, he was thrust into the role of candidate for the presidency. And the public responded eagerly to this new face, this fresh personality. American politics had offered Wilkie an overwhelming opportunity for fame and power. But it would also demand of him a significant price. August 1940, Elwood, Indiana, hails Wendell Wilkie, a hometown boy who made good on Wall Street and now has set his sights on the White House. In former days, America was described as a country in which any young man might become president. It is still that kind of a country. The thousands of my fellow townsmen standing here about know how distant seemed that opportunity to me 30 years ago. Wilkie dresses, speaks, and acts the part of a backcountry boy. But he is, in fact, highly sophisticated. An extraordinary man, product of an extraordinary family. Wilkie is a distinguished attorney and scholar. His wife is the first woman lawyer in Indiana. They are looked on with respect and even with awe by the people of Elwood. Young Wendell Wilkie grows up knowing that he is expected to follow in his parents' footsteps to become a famous lawyer. At Indiana University, Wilkie is a brilliant student. Fond of political debate, he becomes known as a radically inclined intellectual gadfly. Delivering a speech at his graduation, he severely criticizes his professors and the conservatism of the Indiana Supreme Court. Though enraged university officials withhold his diploma for several days, he is finally granted his degree. As a young lawyer, Wilkie looked like an unprosperous traveling salesman. As a friend, his hair was usually tousled. His suit always looked like it had been slept in. Wilkie, however, is eloquent in the courtroom, and he rapidly becomes a shrewd legal strategist. By 1930, he has moved to New York and has become one of the most respected corporation lawyers on Wall Street. In 1933, while representing an electric power company, Wilkie is drawn into one of the bitterest political issues of the decade. In the Tennessee Valley, the federal government is beginning a massive public power project. The TVA is a highly controversial part of President Roosevelt's New Deal. Private power companies protest that the government is using tax money to compete with them, to ruin their business. Wilkie, now president of the giant Commonwealth and Southern Power Company, spearheads the protest against TVA. When he fails to stop the government in the courts, he demands that TVA buy out his company's Tennessee division. The only answer that I have received to date to my proposal is the suggestion that we sell these properties piecemeal to various municipalities. If I accept that proposition, the property of the 280,000 security holders will be either destroyed or jeopardized. Rallying public opinion, Wilkie wins a resounding victory. TVA chairman David Lilienthal is forced to buy Commonwealth and Southern's Tennessee holdings on Wilkie's terms. Mr. Wilkie, I hand you here the check of the Tennessee Valley Authority in the amount of $44,948,396. 
This is the TVA part of the total sum of $78,600,000, which is being paid for your Tennessee property. Thanks, Dave. That's a lot of money for a couple of old Indiana boys to be handling. And for that, I'm going to give you a deed for all of our Tennessee Electric Power Company properties. Good luck, Dave. Good luck, Dave. Although he has always been a Democrat, Wilkie is now congratulated by Republicans across the nation. A few prominent businessmen are so impressed that they offer to back him as a candidate for the Republican presidential nomination. Wilkie is flattered and intrigued by the offer. He sees it both as a refreshing challenge and as a golden opportunity to air his critical view of the New Deal. Spring of 1940, he begins an active campaign for the nomination in typical Wilkie fashion. I have no campaign manager, no campaign fund, no campaign headquarters. All the headquarters I have are under my hat. I have no ghost writers. I've entered into no deals or understanding with any political leaders or anybody else. If I have accidentally nominated an elected president of the United States, I shall go in completely free of any obligations of any kind. I have, however, very frankly, traveled about the country, presented my views to the people, and exhibited myself. If, as a result of this, I am nominated for president at the Republican Convention in Philadelphia, I shall be greatly gratified, and I shall make the best kind of a campaign I know how about principle, in which I believe very deeply. June 1940, the Republicans meet in Philadelphia. Presidential hopefuls Robert Taft and Thomas Dewey dominate the convention. They are backed by professional, high-powered political organizations. Wilkie supporters are also organized, but their political machinery is kept out of the convention hall. While other candidates occupy lavish headquarters, Wilkie holds court in a modest hotel room. His campaign managers continue to picture him as an ordinary man. I want to place the nomination before this great independent body the name of the next president of the United States when I stand in the presence of this man, in this crisis, I say to myself, there's a man big enough to be president of the United States, Wendell Lewis. Well the voting begins. As expected, Taft and Dewey lead. But after four ballots, the convention is deadlocked. Neither Taft nor Dewey can win a clear-cut majority. Seasoned politicians brace themselves for the unexpected. When the stalemate breaks, they know, anything can happen. The poll as taken in Michigan, which I am now announcing, is as follows. Hoover won. the deadlock breaks. A large block of votes suddenly switches from Dewey to Wilkie. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Pennsylvania cast 72 votes for Wendell Wilkie. Wendell Wilkie, a dark horse candidate two months ago, a registered Democrat two years ago, now becomes the Republican presidential candidate. days after the convention, Wilkie and his family are pursued everywhere by reporters and cameramen. For the duration of the campaign, Wilkie's role as husband and father will be a well-exploited campaign asset. Wilkie now belatedly applies for membership in the National Republican Club and meets his running mate, Senator Charles McNary, for the first time. How glad it, I am to come to know you. And before this campaign's over, I'm coming out to visit you on that farm of yours out in Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Wilkie. 
I want you to come as I have the best farm in the country. And I'm a good farmer. You're mistaken about that, Senator. I have the best farm in Indiana. Well, I have the best one outside of Indiana in America. We are now agreed. I'm very happy to have met you. I extend you all good wishes, and I'm gratified at your sincerity. Wilkie, the political novice, sets up headquarters in Colorado Springs. Here, Republican elder statesmen like Herbert Hoover come to give him the benefit of their experience. But veteran campaigners like Alfred Landon find Wilkie unwilling to listen to their advice. Defiantly, Wilkie declares that he agrees with many Democratic policies. And he intends frankly to admit this throughout the campaign. His unorthodox campaign begins in September. And you'll find that throughout the campaign, I shall make no ill remark of either of the gentlemen on the other ticket unless they first make an ill remark about me. Almost immediately, Wilkie's popularity wanes. His so-called sweet and reasonable approach has little dramatic appeal. Wilkie still tries to avoid misrepresenting his views. He bitterly protests when his press agents describe him as a conscientious churchgoer. In reality, Wilkie reminds them, he usually sleeps on Sunday mornings. By the end of his Western tour, Wilkie is in serious trouble. Professionals tell him that he must lash out at Roosevelt. As Wilkie's campaign train rushes east on a new tour, speechwriters turn out hard-hitting attacks on every New Deal policy. Under the New Deal, the employer who puts up money to make a profit has been in the doghouse. If you people want a completely regulated economy, if you want a totalitarian system of some sort, don't vote for me. Though he had once agreed with Roosevelt's policy concerning the war in Europe, he now accuses FDR of dragging the nation into the conflict. American democracy is in danger. My fellow countrymen, I deny that Franklin Roosevelt, whatever his intention, is the defender of democracy. Gradually, in the exhausting grind of the campaign, the issues begin to blur for Wilkie himself. I call each of you to this cause, the greatest cause that ever was offered to free people. Rally around. We cannot lose. We must win. We will win. Wilkie's voice is failing. Every speech is now a painful ordeal, but the excitement of political battle grips him. He drives himself still harder. This man, who had never dreamed of being president, now feels he has never wanted anything else. This is the last untouched land of freedom in all this world. Help me, help me, help me save it! November 1940. Wendell Wilkie's aggressive tactics begin to show results. His popularity rebounds. Election Day. Wilkie votes in New York City. He has convinced himself that his last-minute spurt may have won him the presidency. of the most dramatic and bitterly contested presidential elections in history approaches its climax. Anxious crowds jam Times Square, waiting to spot a trend in the early returns. Within a few hours, Roosevelt takes the lead. By midnight, FDR's margin is widening, and experts declare Roosevelt the winner. Wilkie, however, can't bear to give up hope. He refuses to concede.
in the morning, Wendell Wilkie learns that he has suffered a crushing defeat. In the wake of the election, Wilkie is troubled. He regrets having bowed to expediency in the last weeks of the campaign. Now, with the European war threatening American security, he wants to close the wounds of political battle. Let me raise a single warning. Ours is a very powerful opposition. On November 5th, we were a minority by only a few million votes. Let us not, therefore, fall into the partisan error of opposing things just for the sake of opposition. Ours must not be an opposition against. It must be an opposition for, an opposition for a strong America, a productive America, for only the productive can be strong and only the strong can be free. His loyal opposition speech triggers an indignant explosion in Republican ranks. From now on, Wilkie's position as a Republican leader will be bitterly disputed. Wilkie refuses to answer his critics. He sees no point in further controversy. His interest now centers on the war in Europe. Some observers claim that Hitler will conquer England if the U.S. does not send massive Lend-Lease aid. Wilkie decides to go to England and judge the situation for himself. Wilkie's personal charm wins him hundreds of English friends. He receives a warm reception everywhere, including an English pub. Blitz makes a sobering impression on Wilkie. Thousands of Londoners virtually live in underground shelters. several thousand people. I haven't seen one that was afraid. Here, here. <laughs> As English tour draws to a close, Wilkie decides that the U.S. must send all possible aid to England. Prime Minister Churchill convinces him that the situation is very grave, that without American help, England may soon fall. February 1941. Wilkie testifies before a Senate committee considering Roosevelt's controversial Lend-Lease plan. May I smoke? Yes. Yeah. If you have room enough, <laughs> Britain needs still more destroyers. And gentlemen of this committee, she needs them desperately. The powers asked for are extraordinary, but in my judgment, this is an extraordinary situation. Now, sharp Republican questioning brings out the fact that Wilkie had always favored aid to England even when he denounced Roosevelt for proposing it. Uh, you were a candidate for president last I was. Week. Have you changed your views on uh... Not in the slightest. As a matter of fact, in April, prior to my nomination, I made a speech at Akron, Ohio, in which I called upon the Secretary of State of the United States to ask Britain what we could do to help them. The following day, Republican leaders will brand Wilkie a political traitor. For five months, Wilkie was hailed as the next Republican president. Now, after three more months, he is disowned by the party. Through 1941, Wilkie continues to fight for aid to Britain, opposing isolationists like Charles Lindbergh. We stand for the right of those who do the paying and the dying 
to also have a voice in the deciding. Are we operating under a government by representation? Or are we operating under a government by subterfuge? Ironically, Wilkie is one of President Roosevelt's chief defenders. It does no good to say of the President of the United States, as was said last night, that he acts through hypocrisy or through subterfuge. No man President of the United States at this critical moment could act from such motives as that. In December 1941, America plunges into war. More than ever, Wilkie is committed to support the Roosevelt administration. In 1942, he eagerly accepts a diplomatic assignment that will prove to be the most important task of his public career. With President Roosevelt's enthusiastic endorsement, Wilkie begins a round-the-world tour. He will visit the major nations allied with the U.S. against the Axis powers. During this mission, Wilkie develops a far-reaching understanding of international problems and forms the conviction that the United States must lead a post-war union of nations devoted to democratic ideals. His book, One World, will be one of the most influential and widely read political works of the decade. The world has become interdependent. We must work for the ending of imperialism, for the elimination of the colonial system. Men all over this world are on the march physically, spiritually, intellectually. They also want freedom. They demand it. We must help them get it. In 1944, Wilkie makes a determined bid for the Republican presidential nomination. But his concept of one world is not popular with Midwestern Republicans. A disastrous defeat in the Wisconsin presidential primary forces Wilkie to give up all hope for the nomination. In September, while staying at his Indiana farm, Wilkie suffers a serious heart attack, but he keeps it a secret. I have too much to do and say, he tells a friend, to be written off as an old man with a bum heart. But Wilkie lives only a few more weeks. On October 9, 1944, he will die at the age of 52. Although Wilkie spent only four years as a prominent national figure, he has left a lasting heritage. Writes a reporter, Wendell Wilkie's funeral was a moving event, a proper tribute to a man of stature in national affairs. But in 20 years or 30, or perhaps even 100, there will be another gathering to honor Wilkie's name. On that day, one world will acknowledge its debt to this one man. Wendell Wilkie repeatedly refused to indicate how he would vote in the 1944 presidential election. Yet after his death, both Democrats and Republicans declared that Wilkie would have supported their side. His widow stopped all such speculation. No one could possibly speak for my husband when he was alive, she said, and no one should attempt to speak for him now. Mike Wallace for Biography. <laughs>